we find the disciples are together with Jesus at the Last Supper before He will be arrested and ultimately put to death. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given Him all things into His hands and that He had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside His garments and took a towel. He girded Himself, verses 3 and 4 of John 13. The terminology which we find there in verse 4 when Jesus laid aside His garments was used for laying down one's life in John chapter 10. Four times it appears there in verse 11, verse 15, 17, and also verse 18. Prefiguring then the crucifixion by which the twelve and all obedient believers are cleansed from their sins, Jesus laid aside His garment to wash the disciples' feet. Charles Hodge said, You have to read familiar text more carefully. Today I want us to consider the idea that Jesus washed our feet. If Jesus in any way washed our feet, then we want to consider what does that mean for us. First, we should consider today the feet that Jesus did wash. John chapter 13, we begin reading in verse 5. Then He poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which He was girded. So He came to Simon Peter. Peter said to him, Lord... Do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. It seems that based upon the wording of Jesus' comment in verse 10, when he said, You are clean, but not all of you, that Peter was the last of the disciples whom Jesus washed the feet of. When he came to Peter, Peter somewhat relented. He asked Jesus, Are you going to wash my feet? The emphasis is mine, though in the Greek, the word you and my are emphatic. Peter was very emphatic that the Lord had no position or proper cause to wash his feet. He was the Messiah. He was Lord. He was Master. Peter, in turn, should wash the feet of Jesus. But when Jesus answered Peter's question, he was very emphatic as well. He wanted Peter to know what I do you do not realize now but you will understand hereafter after these things after these things may refer to when Jesus was glorified John chapter 12 and verse 16 points to that and certainly they would have a greater understanding of all things which Jesus had done after his glorification But at this point in time, Jesus simply wanted to note to Peter that Peter did not understand the purpose for Jesus washing his feet. Thus Peter said to Jesus, Never shall you wash my feet, verse 8. Very strong negation in the Greek. For Peter could not in his knowledge find any reason for Jesus to wash his feet. But Jesus affirmed that if Peter was not washed, he would not share in the benefits of Jesus' death. Thus he would have no place among God's people. Therefore Simon Peter said to him, Lord, 
not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Verse 9. If you're reading from the New American Standard Bible or a few other translations, you may find that the term wash has been applied in verse 9. It's been supplied because from Peter's literal statement, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head, we would find that Peter was speaking of being washed. But it's not present there in the Greek. As Peter was simply acknowledging that the Lord needed to wash him, specifically making mention of his hands and his feet, hands and his head, those forms of service to the Lord. Then comes verse 10, as Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Once one has taken a bath and every part of the body is clean, one does not have to take a bath again until the body is dirty again. However, one may need to wash up between bathings. And Jesus needed only on this occasion to wash the feet of the disciples. The very next phrase, Jesus said, And you, you being plural in this case, speaking of all the disciples, you are clean. But then he adds the tagline, but not all. Not all were clean because Judas was among those sitting at the meal. Judas was among those whom Jesus washed the feet of. Jesus knew the one who would betray him was not clean, though Jesus had washed his feet. But just whose feet had Jesus washed after that meal? We take a look at the list of those who were there. There was the feet of Simon, who is called Peter, a man introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew, John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41. He was given the name Cephas by Jesus himself, a name which translates to Peter, first John, or John chapter 1, verse 42. Peter was known for being impetuous, that is, characterized by sudden or rash emotions or actions. He was impulsive. For example, when Jesus walked on the sea, Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 to 29, Peter wanted to do the same. When Jesus foretold his death and resurrection, Matthew 16, 21 to 23, Peter was willing to die with him. Peter was willing to keep that from happening. When he wanted to know how often he should forgive a brother who might sin against him, Peter suggested until seven times, Matthew 18, 21 to 35. When Jesus foretold of some who would stumble, Matthew 26, verses 1 to 35, Peter announced that he would not. And when Jesus, on the occasion which we're looking at today, went to wash the feet of the disciples, when he came to Peter, Peter relented. John chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, because he did not understand. Or when Jesus was arrested in the garden in John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, Peter was willing to stand with him until it became time to stand with the Lord. Then he fled the rest. Peter was known for his failures, doubting when he was walking on the sea, Matthew 14, 30 and 31. When he denied the Lord three times in Matthew 26, 69 to 75, and leading himself and others into hypocrisy. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. However, Peter had some very bright moments when he was walking on the water. Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 and 29. Or when he declared Jesus to be the Messiah. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And when he was reassured by Jesus of his position... And what he needed to do, he accepted that position. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. And thus Peter went on to live up to the meaning of his given name. 
to be a rock. He directed the selection of Matthias in Acts chapter 1. He preached the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Peter was instrumental in the church at Jerusalem during the early years, Acts chapters 3 through 6. Galatians chapter 1 verse 18, Galatians 2, 1 through 10. He proclaimed the gospel to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. And also chapter 15, verses 6 through 11. The feet of Andrew, the brother of Peter, were washed. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, John 1, verse 35 to 40. He led his brother to Christ, John 1, 41 and 42. Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. As already mentioned, he brought his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. He also brought a lad who had five loaves and two fish, which Jesus used to feed 5,000, John 6, verses 8 and 9. He also brought some Greeks to Jesus, John chapter 12, verses 20 and 22. Jesus washed the feet of one named James, the son of Zebedee. James was the brother of John that we'll look at next, Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. Perhaps because of a fiery temperament evidenced by Luke chapter 9, verse 52 and 54, he and his brother were called sons of thunder by Jesus in Mark chapter 3, verse 17. While seeking glory by asking to sit at the right and the left hand of Jesus, James and John were promised suffering, Mark 10, 35 to 40. John and his brother James were called together to follow Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. They and their father were partners with Peter in fishing, Luke 5, verse 10. And like his brother James, John also appeared to be quick to judge others, Luke 9, 49 and 54. However, John became the beloved disciple whom Jesus loved. He became the beloved disciple who sat next to Jesus during the Last Supper, John 13, 23, who was given charge to care for Jesus' mother, John 19, 26 and 27. The disciple who was among the first to see the empty tomb, John 20, verses 2 through 8, who recognized Jesus following the resurrection, John 21, verse 7, who made a veiled a reference to himself being the author of the Gospel of John, John 21, verses 20 to 24. Three letters which bear his name he also wrote, and probably was the one who wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, as John is named. The feet of Philip were washed. Philip was the one who led Nathanael to Jesus, John 1, 45 to 46. Philip and Andrew worked together in bringing the inquiring Greeks to Jesus, John 12, 21 and 22. It was Philip who was the one that inquired of Jesus, Show us the Father, John 14, verse 8 and 9, of which Jesus had to inform him, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Another among those feet that were washed were those of Bartholomew, traditionally considered to be Nathaniel because he is connected to Philip in the list of the apostles in all three gospel accounts of Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6. If this is the case that Bartholomew and Nathaniel are one and the same person, then he is introduced to Jesus by Philip, John 1 verses 45 and 46. He was also praised by Jesus for having no guile. John chapter 1, verse 47 through 51. Jesus washed Thomas' feet. Thomas was also called Didymus, meaning the twelve, or the twin rather. John chapter 12, verse 24. Thomas was willing at least at one point to die for Jesus, John 11 and verse 16. And after the resurrection, he inquired or required rather empirical evidence. Evidence based solely on experience or 
personal observation before he would believe that Jesus was alive. John 20, verses 24 and 25. This evidence was provided a week later to Thomas, and he did believe. John 20, verses 26 to 28. Matthew the tax collector, also called Levi. Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 5, verse 27 have to be compared to find that Matthew and Levi are one and the same. He had his feet washed. He was called the son of Alphaeus, leading some to think that he was related to James, the son of Alphaeus. Mark chapter 2, verse 14. Matthew chapter 10, verse 3. Matthew was called from his tax office to follow Jesus, and he later gave a great feast in his home in honor of Jesus. Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. Then there was James, the son of Alphaeus. He may be James the Less, son of Mary, the Mary who witnessed Jesus' death and sought to prepare his body for burial and also found the empty tomb, Mark 15, verse 40. Other than the list of the apostles, James the son of Alphaeus is not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. Then there's Thaddeus. Thaddeus gave his feet to be washed. Evidently he is one and the same person as Judas, not Iscariot, John chapter 14 verse 22 and Acts chapter 1 verse 13. Also known by Judas, brother of or son of James, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 6, verse 16, and again, Acts chapter 1, verse 13. Outside of these three passages, Thaddeus is not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture either. There was the feet of Simon the Canaanian, Matthew chapter 10, verse 4. He's also called the Zealot in Luke chapter 6, verse 15, and Acts chapter 1, verse 13. The feet of Simon the Canaanian were washed by Jesus after that meal that day. Among those feet that were washed by Jesus were the feet of Judas Iscariot. He's also identified as the one who betrayed Christ, Matthew 10 verse 4, or who became a traitor, Luke chapter 6 and verse 16. Yet he stayed with Jesus when many others from the company withdrew and no longer walked with Jesus. John chapter 6, verses 66 and 67. He was repeatedly identified as one of the twelve even after the betrayal was already underway. Just for an example, consider Mark chapter 14, verse 43 and Acts chapter 1, verse 17. Jesus washed the feet of these men. Going back to John chapter 13, beginning in verse 12. So when he had finished, or when he had washed their feet, and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me the teacher and Lord. You are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. John 13, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, Jesus took up his garment, which he had laid aside, put it back on and returned to the table, reclining again at the table with the twelve. He asked them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Jesus wanted to know if they realized the meaning or the significance of what He had done for them. They had acknowledged and addressed Him as Lord and or Teacher with the appropriate term being selected based on the context of the events. 
Jesus acknowledged that they were right in doing so, that they had spoken accurately of Him. Thus, using a rabbinical type of argument for greater to lesser, Jesus instructed the twelve to wash one another's feet. Verse 14. If I, your teacher, and I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus gave them an example. Verse 15. He demonstrated the very thing He wanted them to do And in a strategic move of His, they were the demonstration subjects of His example. Jesus wanted those men to do the same for one another. He wanted them to act toward one another the same way that He had acted toward them. Washing the feet of what we may consider the best of them also washing the feet of his betrayer. Truly, truly, Jesus said, verse 16, which translates the same word or term that's rendered as amen. Let it be so. Jesus said, let it be so. A slave is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. The lesson was that the disciples did not need to feel too important to perform the acts of service that His Lord performed. Nor is He to expect better treatment from the world than His Lord received. The punchline then is this. Who knew Jesus washed my feet? Who knew that Jesus washed your feet? Consider again these men that Jesus washed the feet of. The Lord, the Teacher, the Master, the Messiah washed the dirty, stinking feet of the impetuous who misunderstood Him that failed him often, but kept on trying, Peter. He washed the feet of one who was religious, but needed to leave following after that which he was following, and to follow him, Andrew. Jesus washed the feet of the short-tempered, who sought the wrong things, though they were on the right path, James and John. He washed the feet of those that were quick to judge others, James and John. The feet of those who were closest to Him, His chosen men, also His inner circle of disciples. He washed the feet of those quiet followers that somehow still missed the big idea, Philip. Amongst the feet He washed were those who had no guile, No deceit, Nathaniel. The feet of a doubter that doubted his resurrection, that doubted the promises he made to them that he was going to rise again, Thomas. He washed the feet of those who were hated by society, Matthew, the tax collector. Men who lived in the shadows of others, maybe even to be considered as those who lived as disciples of Christ in just a mediocre way. Not much is said of James and Thaddeus. He washed the feet of a zealous man, Simon. Zealous to do much. He also washed the feet of one who would after this very occasion would turn him over to be put to death. Judas. If we follow the advice of Charles Hodge and we read familiar texts more carefully, we may find ourselves at the Last Supper reclined with Jesus when he girded himself about 
took the towel and washed our feet. Going back then to John chapter 13, verse 12, Jesus asked a very important question. Do you know what I have done to you? Why would our Lord and our teacher wash our feet? He tells us, verse 13, that He did it to teach service, humble service. He did it, verse 14, to wash the feet of those whose feet needed to be washed. He did it to give an example, verse 15. He did it to show the disciples and to help them to recognize their proper position, verse 16. And He did it to put the disciples to work, verse 17. We've saved verse 17 because it's the conclusion for Jesus. It ought to be our conclusion as well. John 13, verse 17, If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If you know these things expresses the condition to be true to fact. They did know. And so based upon their knowing of it, Jesus said, if you know these things, those who have been taught by Jesus do know. Happy are you if you do them. Happy being that state of happiness shared by the persons who have received God's blessings. And so Jesus has placed before each and every one of us a challenge, a challenge today that Jesus washed the feet of men who were to wash the feet of one another and to wash the feet of others. To teach other disciples to be humble servants. To provide them an example to follow and to cleanse the dirty filth away by accepting the position of service and getting to work serving others. I believe that every person can relate to one of these twelve men whom Jesus literally washed the feet of. By extension, He washed our feet. By application, He washed our feet. Thus we are to do the same. And that's why we stand before you today and verbalize an invitation extended to you by Jesus Christ. An invitation for you to come to Him. We want the lost to be saved. We want those who, like Peter, have misunderstood Jesus to come to know Him and be saved. We want those who are religious but are not following Christ, like John, to come to Him. Those who are religious but are not following Christ the way His Word instructs Simon, who was first following John. Those that are religious but have not been saved by His blood. We want those who are still missing the big idea because of the proper connections have not come together so that they've had that aha moment that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who saves. Philip, who wanted to see God, yet already had missed the big picture those who are doubting the existence of God, those who doubt the resurrection of Jesus, those who doubt the promises given to those who are in Christ, like Thomas, those who are hated by society, Matthew, those living in the shadows of others, James and Thaddeus, those who are guilt-ridden and unforgiving of self, Judas, we want you to be saved before you go the way of Judas. We want Christians who have sinned to be restored. Those who, like Peter, failed Jesus. Those like James and John who are short-tempered or quick to judge others. Those that seek after the wrong things because of their service given to God, James and John. Those who are doubting the truths that they have accepted as Christians, Thomas. And those, again, who are guilt-ridden and unforgiven. Christians who have sinned 
and will not let go of their sin and it's eating them from the inside out. Let go of the sin today and be restored. We want the faithful Christians to be strengthened. Those who like Peter and Andrew who brought scores of people to Christ. Those who like Nathaniel or rather Bartholomew who had no guile, no deceit to be found. And we want those Christians who are following after Christ faithfully but are living Christian lives that are just mediocre, James and Thaddeus. We want you to be strengthened and to be saved as well. Jesus washed our feet. Then He said, John chapter 13, verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who receives whomever I send receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me Jesus wants you to accept him he wants you to receive him so that you can receive the father the one who sent him so today as our invitation is verbalized to you we want you to come and receive Jesus by believing him and his father Hebrews eleven six. We want you come repenting of sin, Acts 26, verse 20, confessing the name of Jesus, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And we want you to be baptized, Acts 22 and verse 16. We want you to come to the feet of the one who washed your feet because he loved you, John 13, verses 1 through 3. He loved you so much that He became a humble servant to teach you great truths, to teach you so that you could know and that you would come to Him. This morning we invite you to come to Jesus as we stand and as we sing.